Okay, so if anybody didn't hear, my name is Chip Marsland, and, the, uh, and David indeed blew me off at that time, and I did not give up, and he's actually grown an inch since then from living on essential nutrients. <laughs> so just to give a little background on me, I'm a uh, protein, nutrition, and food scientist. I'm closing in on nearly 30 years of industry experience. Way back when, I started in the biopharmaceutical industry and, and transitioned into the food via proteins, polyphenolics, and advanced materials. Through those years, I've made many discoveries and developed many new technologies. Now, I'm going to be reading here, so I hope you don't mind, because I'm trying to stay on track. Uh, the many technologies that I've applied and have over probably between 50 to 100 patents worldwide. Now, some of my technologies are pretty cool. I've actually invented what's called structured proteins. One of my favorite is a product, a technology called extensible protein, which really is a uh, interesting thing where you take proteins and can actually make them stretch. Uh, they had controllable tensile strength and break elongation parameters, and they actually were all based off of a novel algorithm that I created based on proprietary chemistry. Uh, through the years, I also developed high-pressure proteinaceous structures uh, based on molding technologies and very special mass balances. Uh, I invented nutritive composites, I invented appliances and different processes. Uh, and then, over the years, I've also created a number of companies. I've started, run, and partnered with many of the big boys. One of the companies I was proud of is a company called Beta Foods. Beta Foods, I started in the 90s, and I actually created a whole, whole new platform of nutritional snack foods. Uh, I teamed with companies such as Royal Numico, GNC, Rexall Sundown, MBTY, uh, Optimum Nutrition, a lot of household names. My products were sold in 24 countries. Uh, I did hundreds of millions of dollars in sales worldwide uh, per year. And then in 2003, 2004, my life changed. Uh, you know, I was on a very fast track. Protein was everything to me. I was really going pretty hard and pretty fast. I was very involved with the sports nutrition industry. Uh, I was involved with diabetes, involved with weight loss. In 2003, uh, my mother was diagnosed. My mother, who was 18 years older than me, was diagnosed with a rare, complicated neurological disease. Doctors told me it was a guaranteed death, and I had a 50% chance of having that due to genetics. Uh, that one statement changed me forever. Uh, I went deep into neurochemistry at that time. I started studying neurochemistry. Now, my background is chemical engineering, industrial engineering, and I have you know, numerous degrees. I was not a neurochemist, except I decided I had to dive into neurochemistry just because of genetics, and I did not understand all the aspects of it, but I had to go deep into it. You know, being in the nutrition industry, being in the pharmaceutical industry, it was something I had to do. Uh, so my focus brought me into an area which I was completely new to, but I decided to pioneer, which is called anthropological biochemistry. And for me, you know, as the nutrition food scientist, I learned something very important, that we are our mothers. And I'm not sure if everybody here knows, but we are all essentially the same exact genetic makeup as our mothers, not our fathers. And so anything that we get is gonna come straight through our maternal line. And so for me, facing a neurological disease based on, you know, unknown, uh, I had to go look at it. I was 34 years old at the time, and they told me I'd probably be dead at age 50. Um, so what I did, I dove in, and I learned as much as I could possibly do about dementia, Alzheimer's. My mother's case was a, a rare combination. It was a disease called CBGD. And it was a combination of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and cerebral palsy. And it was, yeah, it was a, it was a pretty intense thing. Uh, and what we did, I did, is I dove into the genetics. I dove into the causes of these diseases. And I had no idea. Now, I'm in the nutrition industry. I had no idea that these were food-related. And what was most interesting to me is that they were avoidable. So at that time, I was actually on the board, the food board, of a very large corporation called Archer Daniels Midland. Most people may have heard of it. And I was commuting to Australia, co-running a company down there, and I was co-venturing with Heineken. Uh, and some of my work was in, based on alternatives to alcohol also. Uh, that's what I was working on with Heineken. And I decided to stop everything. 
You know, commuting back and forth to Australia took a little bit of time, and New Zealand was lovely, but I had to get back to things. So what I did is I came back and I sold my company, and I quit my deal with Heineken, and I teamed up with a friend of mine who had written a very popular book uh, called The Zone Diet. And what I did is I went in to run the company with him, and I was the president of the company, and I actually decided to make it my goal to convert Zone to one of the most worldwide recognizable diet programs. It was based on something that I appreciated at the time. It was actually based on a fairly neutral philosophy, and it was logical. So it wasn't based on an extreme. I had another friend named Bob Atkins who was way over here. Uh, There's others that were way on the other side, and Zone was kind of in the middle at the time. And so what I did, I went in to run the company because it was not extreme. It showed great results, uh, especially in inflammation reduction. Uh, blood sugar control was a big deal because blood sugar has direct ramification on the health of our brain as well as on our whole system and more. Uh, I dove in creating hundreds and hundreds of products and building plants worldwide. Uh, I became top of the class over the course of about, I ran that company for almost, 70 years, almost eight years, and I became ranked by Consumer Reports as one of the top in the industry. Uh, my work in satiety, which is where foods induce satiation, the sense of not being hungry, uh, became world class. As I advanced the diet, and the portfolio and the science behind it, I realized there was much more to nutrition than just a controlled parameter. And to me, as great as zone was, it wasn't everything. And so what I did, I had to look deep. And what I discovered in, through my work is that the ingredients I were using, now, and, and believe me, I invent ingredients also. I don't just settle for things. I actually invent not only the foods, I invent the ingredients that go into the foods. I found that my food, my food ingredients were awful, okay? First, I was trying to preserve foods that were wet. Uh, they had water in them, so that mean I had to use preservatives. I had to actually look at things. I had to look far beyond just, just what the foods were. Because part of our job in the food industry is to make sure our foods don't go bad. So we actually do all sorts of things to the foods, and primarily, we killed them. And so here I am, running a very popular worldwide food company, and what it was is, everything I was doing was wrong. My nutritional profiles were right, but everything inside the food was wrong. And so what I did, I decided shelf life was not the most important thing. Shelf life with a wet food is absolutely the wrong approach. Because first, we have to actually kill the nutrients to be able to make the product, to be able to stay on a shelf. So every time you walk into a grocery store and you see something that's wet, just know that's probably a, de a dead food. And so from there, I, I decided to even dive deeper. And so what I did, I decided to study and use my experience and concluded conventional food processing was the death of everything. It was not just the death of my foods, it was the death of every food in every grocery store. Because first, the only way they can actually have those foods on the grocery store shelves is if they killed it. So what we look at are items, you know, very conventional items. You know, you can take some pretty simplistic ones. Sorry, as I reach in here. But you know, a good example of a dead food is Campbell's soup, okay? This is a very dead food. This is processed at high temperature. There's absolutely nothing in here that's gonna even do anything for the human body. That's just one example, all right? So for me, a guy ranked by Consumer Reports for nutrition and diet, I wasn't doing it right. I'd missed it. I was all, but yet it was all right in front of me and I had to figure that out. So what I did, I knew all modern foods lack nutrients, not just protein, but they lack something even more important. They lack essential nutrients, which is the key element of life, okay? And when you really look at diet, what are we missing? And it really came down to the fundamentals because we're all humans. You see, it was logical to kill foods. Over the years, a society became focused on taste and shelf life. It didn't become focused on what humans really needed, it became focused on taste. Shelf life was the dictator by the grocery stores, by the food industry, and the only reason is that we need to transport things from, you know, Chicago, Midwest, East, you know, overseas, wherever we're going. Many people don't know a lot of foods are even made over in Indonesia, shipped over here to the States. Pepperidge Farm is a great example. Pepper Pepperidge Farm cookies, most of them are made in Indonesia and get shipped all the way over here. So you have to have extremely long shelf life to actually go through these processes. So over what I did, um, I kept going, you know, and I, and I realized that the foods weren't just being made for shelf life, but they were being made 
with addictive qualities. The processes that they were made through not only killed them, but as I said before, they started killing them even more so. But I wanted to know why, and it focused in on when this all began. So my conclusion was I had to study when this all began, and I went back to the beginning of the food, the processed food industry. And so what I really learned is that in 1911 is really the pivotal point. 1911 was a really important invention. It's called hydrogenated oils, okay? Before then, what we were doing is we're using, you know, things that weren't shelf stable. We're using lard, we're using tallow, animal fats. We didn't have any, any products like this in the marketplace, and you know, thankfully a company like Procter & Gamble could create something quite innovative at the time. And actually, if you go to their website, you'll find the whole timeline on this too. They're very proud of it. Crisco was invented in 1911. Now, that single invention, okay, single invention eliminated the use of everyday products such as lard and tallow. Uh, and what it also did, it eliminated all the short shelf life products. And then all of a sudden, it allowed the creation of a whole new realm of foods known as stable foods. And now these stable novelties, because back then they were novelties, uh, were invented. Matter of fact, this year, 1911. Now 1912 was another big year, okay? And it was this, all right? So in 1912, <laughs> this product was invented. Um, and for those who don't know, this is a Crisco cookie, okay? So the center of the Oreo cookie that everybody loves so much is Crisco, all right? And because of Crisco, we actually had other inventions that came along the line too. And this is another good one that was invented shortly thereafter, okay? And so Twinkies also came after Crisco, and it came after Oreos. But this is just the beginning, people. This was just a few. But there's so many more. And if you look back over time, I mean, back in, back in these days, you know, in this time frame, our phones were giant wooden telephones, and we drove Model Ts, except our food industry has not advanced since then. Our food industry is actually still in that same time frame. We still use the same exact technologies made then, same exact ingredients, only we've gotten worse. And so my research made me dive even deeper. And what I realized is that this invention here changed food forever. And what, what worse happened is that during the, during the wars, World War II, the US government decided to, had to actually feed the troops. The troops weren't eating the food because it was awful, it was slop, it was, you know, the terminology slop comes from the military back then. And I know I'm a military brat, and so I've heard all the stories. And so what happened is the U.S. government decided to finance a whole research program uh, on neurochemistry called the Bliss Point. Now the Bliss Point is a very important discovery because it concluded that the right amount of sugar, the right amount of salt, and the right amount of fat made food highly appealing and addictive, okay? And what it did is it would boost the dopamine levels in your brain, create an imprint on your brain, and actually have you want more. It's exactly the same thing that happens with cocaine. And what happens with foods today is that that bliss point is used every day, and it's gotten to the point where now they're actually putting it into baby foods, so you can actually have it, so you can be imprinted at a very young age, and you continue your life remembering those foods as a child, all right? And guess what? It worked really well. The food industry got a hold of this during the 60s and financed endless amounts of research on it. That's why yogurts today are loaded. Yogurts don't taste good unless they're loaded with lots of sugar, okay? We also have other products that have come through the pipeline, which, you know, I don't even know if you can call them food, but you got things like this. Fruit roll-up, okay? I don't even know what fruit roll-up is, but it's really not a food, okay? <laughs> and there's many other things that come through too. The ones that I like, you know, which everyone thinks here, and I have arguments with some of my colleagues about cereals, but cereals are awful. But you look at things like Lucky Charms, you know? I don't know if, is this food or what this is, because, you know, I can't figure it out. But the, but the key here is that foods became highly addictive due to this bliss point. But the other thing that I really realized is that they lacked everything we needed as humans. They have no nutrients, they're nutrient void. Uh, and my conclusion is that the industry and its philosophies are the single cause of fast human death. 
The consequences are far greater than we even realize because we have been struck by things that used to be called malnutrition. Now they have a new name, okay? We call it chronic disease, and that entails diabetes, cardiovascular disease, dementia, Alzheimer's, hypertension, and more. I don't know if anybody remembers, you know, was it Sally? It wasn't Sally Fields. It was the girl from uh, All in the Family used to do those malnutrition commercials when, we were, when I was younger back in the 60s and 70s. Who, what was she? Sally Struthers, and you know, we called it malnutrition then. Our new nomenclature today is chronic disease. I'm sure everybody here has heard about chronic disease. It's nothing more than malnutrition. And our bodies suffer the same consequences. It's no different. So let me, let me get into this. You know, one of, the, one of the most important things is that why we eat food. And David's right. I started talking about this years ago, and one of my presentations was called What is Food? And I was giving a presentation, it was probably 600 people. And I remember I started What is Food? And I watched about 100 people get up and walk out. <laughs> uh, actually, I thought it was quite important because I actually was looking at things and comparing Oreo cookies to donuts and trying to figure out which one was actually a more nutritional product. And uh, I'll even ask anybody here. So what do you think, a uh, Oreo cookie or a donut? <laughs> All right, the answer is a donut. But can anybody tell me why? Yeah, the reason is it actually has one essential nutrient in it. And it's uh, called water, okay? <laughs> so, but what we have here, so I have a little presentation to show you what happens with food. I'm not quite sure if I'm going to be able to get this, but I'll try. All right, so the human body itself is actually made up of 37 trillion cells. That's a lot of cells. And within those cells, we have this other little tiny organelle called mitochondria. And we have over 100,000 trillion mitochondria. Now, mitochondria are why we eat food. Okay? Let's see if this works. So when we eat something very nourishing, such as that oatmeal you folks had today, it goes into our system. The body processes it, sends it the nutrients, remember it's filled with nutrients, throughout the body, and good things happen, okay? But when we actually start looking at what happens, the nutrients start being transferred into the cellular system, they get absorbed into the mitochondrial system, and actually we create great balance. And energy is created. But when we eat other things that actually are termed non-foods, we have a whole different reaction, okay? And the body starts going into chaos. And you don't know it, but it actually happens every single time you consume a non-food product. And the reason is, is that the nutrient-less foods actually cause very negative reactions. If you notice, there's less colors here. And the colors are indicated on the nutrients. And what happens is the mitochondria go into a complete chaotic cycle. And they don't know what to do, and they have this electron that they need, and there's a whole imbalance. But when we actually go a little bit deeper into this at the same time, we actually have an effect on our lives. People who live with balance versus people who live out of balance, sadly, there's a difference in life. There's a great difference in life. And, the, and as you can see, the ones who live in balance will live a lot longer. What I was really fascinated by is that our cells are not programmed to die. We kill them. And so when we incorporate things like bigger forms of oxygen, exercise versus a life of lethargy, you know, we have a whole different approach. And so we actually look at life a little differently, at least I do, and I value myself on the left, not on the right. But there's other ramifications at the same time. When we eat these foods and we put them into our system, we have a mucosal lining that's very susceptible to problem. And so when we look at this, some of these ingredients that we consume every day actually penetrate our mucosal line in our gastrointestinal system. And I don't know have, if anybody's ever thought about it, but think about your proximity of your stomach, your gastrointestinal system, to your other organs. And so what happens if we actually start eating too much sugar and it penetrates and creates holes in our mucosal line? We have very small cells down there. They're very susceptible to death. And so what happens is they actually create holes in the system. It's very close to our heart. It's very close to all our organs. And I'll tell you, some of, the, some of the problems in this, now I face this because I've actually had a mother who died at my age. By the way, I've lived longer than she did now. 
So here, part of this is the, the impact affects every component of our body. It affects our neurological system, it affects our cardiovascular system, it affects our pancreatic system. Uh, when we go deep, not just our gastrointestinal, but our hormonal system, all of it is impacted. And so all of this is avoidable. And it's all through something so simplistic and so logical and so human, it's just called essential nutrients. And they're called essential for a reason. Now, on that note, I'm going to actually let everyone know I have a lot of talking tonight, so I don't want to bore you with much more. And this evening, I have the joy of actually having everybody come to me to talk, so any questions you can save for later. But I'm actually going to take this now, and I'm going to transition over to the next speaker. I know I'm taking up her time. And she's an old friend of mine. Well, not literally. Uh, she's a friend of mine for 20 years out of Harvard. We were both in Cambridge for a very long time. Uh, and her name is Dr. Stacy Bell.